So we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, what I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. And just to say this as we do get started is... This, this specific message is intended for everyone at Restoration Life and those who are going to watch online who feel the real need to pray and contend for America in our current situation. So this may not be a message for everyone, all right? So hopefully it's a message for everyone here, but just even those who would listen online, look, you know, you may not have the same burden we have to pray and to contend for our nation, and that's okay. But that's, who we're, that's what this message, that's the audience of this message, is those who feel gripped by the Lord as we cannot quit right now. Amen. So I just want to say that so I don't get any hate mail like, why are you being political? I, I'm not being political. I'm calling the church right now to pray. I'm calling the church right now to intercede for our nation. So just to say that Luke chapter 18 if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, and I, I realize where we're at right now as a nation, and I realize the church right now is battling some discouragement. And if you feel like right now, what is true? And I can't even tell what truth is. I mean, how many feel like, okay, you hear this and you hear that, and you're like, what is even going on? I can't even figure out what really is even true right now. L listen, we are in the fog of war right now. That's what we're in right now. And it's really hard to figure out, okay, what is really true? And I, and I want to come today by, by uh, speaking from Luke chapter 18. And Jesus was telling them a parable. Now catch this, to show them at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. That is, I believe that's the word of the Lord to the American remnant, and I just, I just want to say American, the remnant church around the world who sees the great need, the great need for uh, prayer at this particular time. Are, are the, sorry, just real quick, are the kids staying in or, or going out? I forgot to make the announcement. Okay, we are waiting for all of our workers. So once the, once the workers get here, because we're doing things a little bit different, then the kids will go out. So I just got a look from my daughter going, oh, God, he's preaching again. It's going to be forever. So just wanted to just, just, just make that announcement. So anyway, so Jesus is talking, and he comes to this place, and he says that men ought to pray at all times. And I realize, and I, I realize, I realize right now that the body of Christ right now is really fragile, especially those that have, that have stood in the gap. And this is really who I'm, I'm preaching to today. Those that have contended, those that have stood in the gap, those that have warred for the destiny of this nation not to become a socialist nation. That there's a weariness that has come on us. I know there's a, even a, even a, like, you know, some of them can feel discouraged, but I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today. And I want to encourage you with the words of Jesus. It may not look great right now, right? It may not look great right now, but I want to just with all my heart encourage you not to stop fighting and interceding until it's finally settled. It, God has the final word. It's not over yet. God has the final word. And I would say this is coming to what Jesus said. I want you to just, I'm going to just say it over and over to us. It's, I believe it's the, the little phrase, the word of the Lord. Men ought to always pray and not lose heart. Don't lose heart right now. Don't lose heart. To, the, to those who are praying and interceding that I know there is a remnant that have been gripped by the burden of the Lord to stand in the gap and pray for this nation. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. We cannot quit until it's finally over. We cannot quit until it's been officially settled. We must continue to pray and not lose heart. And here's the issue going on here in Luke 18. There was a judge. He didn't fear God. He did not respect man. And a widow kept coming to him and saying, you know, just this persistence. Give me legal protection for my opponent. And the widow just would not quit bugging him. You know, sometimes you, got, you have kids and you can relate to that. Like, they're like, Dad, can we do this? Dad, can we do this? Dad, can we do this? And you're not really intending to do it, but finally you go, yes. 
we can do it. And you don't really want to do it, but they bugged you so much that finally you say, okay, I'm going to do it or else you're going to drive me crazy. So, so anyway, that's the kind of thing Jesus is saying here is don't lose heart. Be persistent in prayer. It doesn't matter if we're saying the same thing over and over again. I mean, I don't think there's anything else new we could possibly say that we haven't already prayed. But that's the point is, is that it's persistence. It's continuation. It's just this place where we say, okay, God, we are going to continue to contend. We're going to continue to cry out to God. We are not going to be silent now. We are not going to be silent now. And he said, give me legal protection from my opponent. Opponent. For a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man... Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. The Lord is encouraging the body of Christ. Do not stop praying for justice to be established. You cannot stop praying for justice to be established. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Verse 7, now... Listen to this. Just, just, I want you to see this, and I want you to receive it. If you're battle-weary of interceding, if you're, if you're just fatigued and despondent and discouraged, I want you to hear well, how the Lord would come and encourage you. He said, now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? He will, and he, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. Amen. If you're one who is like us at Restoration Life, you are interceding right now for this great battle we're in as a nation. I want to encourage you with these words. Don't grow weary. Always pray. Cry out for justice. If justice is not served in this election, we will never, ever, I don't, I mean, and without divine intervention, ever recover from this. It's that serious right now. If we lose justice in this nation, we've lost everything. And I want to encourage you, it might look bleak, it might look discouraging, it, you know, it might look as if, you know, the, what we are hoping for doesn't win. But here's the thing is, don't stop. Don't quit. The issue here, again, is not who is elected president. The issue is, is there voter fraud? Is there voter fraud right now? And if there's voter fraud that has swung the election and justice is not served, America likely will never have another, another uh, election where the, where the will of the people is truly uh, influences what happens. It's important, very, very important that as an, as an intercessors who are standing in the gap for America, that God brings about justice. And if you're an American and you love our constitution and you love the way God has done to found our nation, this is not a bipartisan issue. This is not a bipartisan issue. This is not Republican versus Democrat. This is about justice. I've done enough research to realize this, you know, there has been substantial voter fraud in this election. Substantial voter fraud. And if justice is not served in this election, your vote will never matter again. It will not. We cannot quit right now crying out to God, interceding for God, for God to bring about justice. We've got to have justice or else the constitutional republic will become a banana republic and will never again be, will never again be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's that important. We cannot quit now. We cannot surrender now. We must continue to contend uh, for the Lord for justice, that he would bring forth justice and bring it forth speedily. Amen? God has given to us 
a twofold prayer assignment here at Restoration Life, and uh, probably others watching would have a very similar assignment, but God has given us at Restoration Life a prayer assignment, and I'm assuming that assignment's going to last until the election is finalized, that we are, cont we're mandate, I feel like this is a mandate from heaven. I've, I've felt like I've never been more resolutely focused, more determined <laughs> than I've ever been in my life. We are to contend in prayer and intercession and spiritual warfare for the exposure of voter fraud and for justice to be served. That's number one. Again, this is not about Trump versus Biden right now. This is not about that right now. This is, this is about voter fraud and justice because if we lose justice in our country, we've lost everything, everything. The second thing is, is we have a mandate that to pray for the, the two Senate state, the two Senate seats in Georgia. It's no coincidence, I don't believe, that for us, that the, this whole Senate race has come down to these two seats in Georgia. And I believe God has called us as an intercessory group of people, of men and women. Right now, like Esther, you have been born for such a time as this. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Now is not the time to be quiet. Now is not the time to be silent. Now is not the time to restrain yourself. Now is the time to pray and to intercede. Because if we, here, here's what's really at stake. Here's what's at stake. I, I want you to, I just want to be honest with you right now. This is truly what is at stake right now. If Trump is to lose... And, we, and the Republicans lose two Senate seats. Here's what's at stake. The Democrats are going to pack the Supreme Court and they're going to shift it to the left in an irreversible way. New states, they're already talking about this, new states are going to be created to ensure Democrats never lose another election. Our constitutional republic is going to be replaced with socialism. Socialism. Our national sovereignty is going to be surrendered to global government. That is my biggest concern right now. That's a big deal right now. And if you haven't studied what's going on, I'm telling you, that's a big deal. Our national sovereignty surrendered to global government. The Green New Deal would be pushed through Potential, I'm saying these are likely things. I'm not making a predictive prophecy. I'm saying these are likely things to happen. Aligning America with the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'm just going to just make it real simple. That's worldwide socialism. That's worldwide socialism. Where technocrats at the top become rich and they have control over society and the world. So listen, we've got to fight right now. The next thing, the Great Reset. Have you heard, I don't know if you've heard about the Great Reset. You need to learn about the Great Reset. That's coming next, the Great Reset. The elite, and I'm talking about the elite of the elite with money, power, influence. They want to destroy capitalism and set up an economic one world economy where they get rich, personal property will be eliminated and you will live on a month, universal monthly income that cannot be saved or carried into another month. The World Economic Forum released a video, and one of the things they said in it is, you, is it had the smiling guy on the video, and he's like, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is not conspiracy theory. This is real. This is real. This is real. This is what we're battling for right now. This is what we're battling for, the elimination of personal property and a universal basic monthly income. We can't lose this. We've got to fight. We've got to contend. We've got to cry out to God for justice. We've got to cry out to God and intercede until the battle's over. God has the final word, not human governments, not the elite. Read Psalm chapter 2. The elite conspire together against God, and God is not moved by their plans. He sits in the heavens and he laughs at them. He's not moved right now by what's going on. 
He's unmoved. He's unfazed. He is laughing at their plans. And the word of the Lord to them is kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. This is all about Jesus Christ, ultimately. It's all about God's ultimate intention. It's all about God having what he wants rather than us getting what we want in this. So just to give you an idea, there's, there's four phases of prayer for this election, in my opinion, that, that we need to be aware of. Number one is discerning the will of God. Many prophetic voices have spoken. Now, I, I, I do realize there's a lot of, of chatter and conversation right now about, well, the prof, these prophets said Trump's going to win. He didn't win. The prophetic is messed up. And I, I, listen, those conversations need to be had. But I don't believe they're to, we're to have those right now. Those are premature. The battle is not over yet. The battle's not over yet. Listen, if for some reason it, their predictions don't come to pass, we need to have real conversations because the prophetic integrity has got to, to be, we got to have prophetic integrity. We cannot have people doubting the prophetic. And we'll, that's something we'll cover in 2021 if, if things go what, you know, what seems like is going right now. But that's not now. We can, we, I believe we need to use the prophetic words to continue contending for God's will to be done. The second thing is the American people voting according to God's will. I, that's, that's already taken place, obviously. The third one and the fourth one. The third one is all voter fraud must clearly be exposed to a skeptical world. It has to be exposed. And I've seen a lot of reports, but, it, but we, you know, if, if, there's, if there's enough voter fraud that, that sincerely swung this election, it has to be exposed. That's what we're contending for. That nothing that has been in darkness would be able to stand. We've got to see everything exposed, that God would bring exposure. Like Lou Engel was praying, expose, expose, expose. We need exposure for all voter fraud that happened with the Dominion voting system and what happened with mail-in ballots and dead people voting and all of that. We need that exposure to come to the light. And the fourth thing, which is what I'm kind of talking about today, is justice has to be served wherever proven fraud has happened. Amen? We've got to have justice. We've got to have justice. It's scary to think this, but Stalin said, it's not who votes that counts. It's who counts the votes. We've got to, have, we've got to ensure by prayer and intercession that the, the will of the people was really and truly done in this election. Harry Truman said, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it has only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. That's why I'm saying Justice must be served. We've got to have God's justice. God has the final word. And if the church will not quit, and if the church will not lose heart, and if the church will not grow weary, and if the church will contend, and if the church will stand in the gap and say, God, bring justice into this speedily, you know, it's all in his hands right now. This battle is not yours but his. And if he does not get involved, then it's not going to go the way we hope. So it's, uh, you know, we're, we're right now, we, we have no hope. We're, we're uh, helpless, really. That's not a bad place to be in. That's not a bad, I want to encourage you, that's not a bad place to be in, to feel as if you, you have, you have, you're helpless. And it's one of those but God moments. And that's where we are right now. This Thursday will be the 157th year of the Gettysburg Address when Lincoln in Pennsylvania spoke these, some of the most incredible words a president has ever spoken. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just some highlights for you here is four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And I would also add to it that I believe with all my heart, the Lord is the one who sovereignly in his providence led our founding fathers to establish a nation of liberty. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. I believe we're in such a moment right now in our nation's history. This nation under God, listen to what he said, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. That's, where, that's the crossroads that America is at right now. Is are we going to have, are we going to have government control or are we going to have freedom? That's the crossroads America is at right now. That's why the church must pray, pray like never before. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Be encouraged. Stand in the gap. Cry out to God. You do not know what's going to happen. Like Joel said, he said, what if God leaves? He says, who knows if God might just leave a blessing behind him? He called them to, he called them to prayer. He called them to intercession. In other words, you don't know what God might do. If we stop, we will never know. But if we continue and we press in and we press through and we go all the way, who knows what God might do? Don't stop. Don't quit. We cannot right now quit. We cannot fail. We cannot grow weary. We must continue and contend until the very end. Who knows what might happen? But we'll never know if we quit. I, I gotta, I've got a sense God's good. I've got a sense that God loves this nation. Who knows what he might do. We are in a but God moment. And only God can determine what's going to happen. We cannot quit in our prayers. He goes on and he says that government of the people, I love this. Has there ever been another nation in history where there's been a government of the people by the people, for the people. He says, that shall not perish from the earth. That is in jeopardy. A government of the people, by the people, for the people, right, right now, that's in jeopardy. If, this, if, if voter fraud was committed and it's suppressed and justice is not served, of the people, by the people, for the people, is forever removed. I don't say forever because I'm... Is, Unless God, a war or God intervenes, it's, it's removed from our country. That's where we're at right now. I, I've heard some Christians, and in fact, I've, uh, yeah, I've heard some Christians say, well, Christians shouldn't really get involved in this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, when you have a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and for us at this time to not step in and sound a voice and, and be a voice and pray to God in this, in this thing, I believe that's abdicating our responsibility to be salt and light. I realize right now, I realize, I realize that America is not the kingdom of God. Donald Trump is not the Messiah. Washington, D.C., thank God, is not the new city, Jerusalem. I mean, I know... God forbid. You know, I realize Jesus' kingdom is not of this world and we're, we're not to be of this world. We're citizens of another thing. And I'm not saying that we need to, you know, say that America and the kingdom of God are one because that's absolutely not the truth. But what I'm saying is that, that Christians, when you have a, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, we cannot lose our responsibility that Jesus himself gave us. And that is to be salt and light in our communities. If we're not salt, if we're not salt in our communities, if we're not salt in, in I'm just going to say it in, in the place of prayer, if we're not salty and we're not preserving the culture, then you're going to get exactly what you deserve. A government of oppression, a government that takes away liberties, a government that takes away freedom. Jesus said... That if, if the salt loses its saltiness, it's no good for anything except to be trampled down underfoot by men. See, if the church right now, if we lose our saltiness, if we just say, well, I have, you know, it's just, I'm not going to get involved in politics and I'm not going to get in involved in governmental affairs. Now, I'm talking specifically today about intercession, praying for our nation. 
then we are going to get exactly what we deserve, a government that is going to trample down the saltiness that Christianity is meant to influence in our nation. We cannot do it. We cannot be silent right now. We must be light right now. We must shine light right now. Don't, now think about this. Think about this. Our nation was born in Pennsylvania. Our nation was reborn in Pennsylvania through the Gettysburg Address. And look at it now. It could very well be Pennsylvania who determines if America continues as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We can't quit. We cannot quit. Don't be silent now. There's a famous Lutheran pastor during the time of Hitler's rise to power, and he was sent to a concentration camp for opposing him. And here's what he said. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Larry Alex Taunton took this and applied it to our day and our current situation. He said, when they killed the unborn, I said nothing because it didn't affect me. When they destroyed the economy, I said nothing because I had a job. When they defunded the police, I said nothing because I believed the police are er evil narrative. When the quarantines allowed lawless protest but barred synagogues and churches from meeting, I said nothing because I was neither a Jew nor a Christian. When they committed voter fraud and censored conservatives, I said nothing because I didn't like Trump and was not a conservative. When they spoke of Marxism and then implemented it, I said nothing because I didn't understand what it was until it was too late. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my, I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know about him, he was a German theologian and pastor and prophet during World War II who, who openly resisted Hitler. And he said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Hear that, listen, listen to that one more time. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. To be quiet right now, church, to be quiet right now, to not speak up right now when we're seeing all that's taking place is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not, I'm going to add my words. Not to pray is to speak. Not to act is to act. If we're silent now, if we're silent now, if we're prayerless now, we have spoken and we have taken action. Silence in the face of evil is evil. If voter fraud has taken place and we don't rise up as the church and intercede against that fraud, we have been, in, a, in, in essence, part of the problem. We cannot be silent now. We cannot quit now. We must continue until the end, praying and interceding for God's will to be done. When we went to Germany in 2017... And Angie is like, always reminds me, yeah, and you went without me. <laughs> it, it was, besides Ireland, one of my, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, she always reminds me of that. But uh, when we went there, it was, it was awesome. I mean, just, sorry, you might want to shut your ears, Angie, right now. So it was incredible. I mean, the, it was just like, just perfect. Just a love Germany. I was thinking, how in the world could such incredible people have been deceived by Hitler to accept National Socialism and the Nazi Party and that whole agenda. It's like, God, I don't even understand. How could that even happen? How could that possibly happen? 
Fast forward three years to 2020, and it's happening right now in America. If you don't see that, you're deceived. The very same spirit that operated in Nazi Germany is operating in our government at the highest levels. And to see half of our nation, and I don't, I don't even know if it's half of our nation. I don't, I don't believe the vote. I believe that Donald Trump won a lot bigger than is being reported personally. So I don't believe it's that many people. But a, a good portion of our nation right now being deceived by the media and the propaganda and the manipulation and the witchcraft, their brains being washed by what they're being told by the narrative of the media I'm like, oh, now I understand how Germany could be deceived because America is being deceived right now by the same spirit. That very same spirit is at work. We, like Bonhoeffer, we must resist that spirit. It's an antichrist spirit. We cannot accept it. We cannot tolerate it. We cannot just lay down and be silent right now. We must rise up in prayer. The the voice of the church must not be silenced by censorship, by big tech, by the media, by those who want us to be silent and go feed the poor. The church must rise up in a prophetic spirit and say, no, we are confronting the spirit of Antichrist that's trying to take our nation astray. Now, I'm talking primarily about intercession right now. I'm talking primarily about the place of prayer. We, We must resist this attempt of the enemy to take our nation down. We cannot be silent right now. We cannot be still right now. Isaiah 28, 5 says, this is, I want you to mark this scripture, very, very important scripture for where our nation is right now. Isaiah 28, verse 5. In that day, it's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about the end of the age. I'm going to apply it out of context just for uh, for this uh, particular situation. In that day, the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. It's the remnant that's going to save this nation. It's not the majority of the church. The majority of the church just say, let's just go on with life as usual, life as normal, everything will be like it was. Just like most of the, a significant amount of the church in Germany did in the days of Hitler. That's why Bonhoeffer broke off and started the confessing church because he saw many of the Christians were sucked right into socialism, national socialism. It became the German state church. That same kind of dynamic is at work and is going to be at work in this country. It is going to be the remnant that saves this nation. It's going to be the remnant that saves this nation. The praying, spirit-filled remnant is going to save this nation. That is who you are. That is who you are. We cannot fail right now. We cannot quit right now. We must continue and persevere right now. We need to pray, listen to this, for a spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment. Man has has our, you know, is there ever a more pertinent prayer right now? Judgment for those who are going to rule in this case, for those who are going to rule in the cases to come, Justice has been taken out of this nation because those leading love money and they love power and they love control. They've lost the spirit of justice. They are, they are corrupted by bribes. They are corrupted by power. They are con- corrupted by money and greed. How? You know, we just need in prayer to say, God, ri- raise up a spirit of justice for those who sit in judgment. It's absent in our nation right now. It's absent in our nation. I've watched these past four years when so many things have been uncovered and there's been absolutely no justice. Spying on a duly elected president, no justice. The the evidence is overwhelming. No justice whatsoever. The, The truth suppressed. The Bidens receiving money from the Ukraine and China. No justice. The truth suppressed. 
I mean, I could go on and on and on. Our country is coming to an end if we do not have justice for those who sit in judgment. We must have that. We must have that right now. And so I'm going to encourage every intercessor listening and watching to contend in prayer for God to release a spirit of justice for whoever sits in judgment, governors, legislators, judges, mayors, uh, whatever, every area, there would be a spirit of justice for those who sit in judgment and they would not be corrupted by the bride. They would not be corrupted by power. They would not be corrupted by control. The other thing is we need to pray is we need to continue to cry out to God for strength for those who are, who are turning the battle back at the gate. There is, uh, there is a weariness right now on the praying church, a discouragement right now on the praying church, you know, a, a confusion. What is God saying? What is happening we're right now in the fog of war, and we really can't make out right now what is even going on. Listen, it's going to become all clear in the days ahead, I hope. I mean, in terms of what I think should be made clear. But right now, we, we need to cry. I mean, people are battle-weary. People are fatigued. People are disheartened. We need to cry out to God for those leading the battle on the front lines for strength. That would include the, the praying church, the remnant church. That would include the president, his legal team. That would include all those who are aligned with him. We need to pray for them for that, that strength would be given to those who turn the battle back at the gate. That, that is so important right now, so important. I want to encourage you. I want to just, that's what I'm here to do today. I want to encourage you of the power of prayer. Don't ever lose fact of the power of prayer. James 5.16 says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It does not matter what the media says. It does not matter what the elite and the globalists say. It does not matter what any, any nation says right now. I'm telling you that there is great power in prayer. You may not feel it. You may not, I mean, it may just be dead to you when you pray. That's, God's answer to prayer does not depend on how you feel when you pray. It does not matter how eloquent it is when you voice the words. It does not matter if you scream or shout. I'm telling you, there is great power that is released when the church prays. Do not quit praying. Do not quit interceding. We must continue to contend. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, this is the uh, New King James Version, avails much. I love that, the operative, effective, the fervent prayer, not just these weak little, Jesus, if it be thy will. I'm talking about God, we have been invaded we need justice. We need a breakthrough. We need you to intervene. God, would you step in into this crisis and would you let your kingdom come and let your will be done? Expose the injustice and bring justice speedily. We've got to have a fervency in our intercession. We've got to cry out to God with everything in our heart. Now is not the time to be weak or passive or silent. We've got to voice our intercession right now because it has great power. Great power. That's what I want to encourage you with. These little prayer meetings we're having, three, four nights a week, and now we're just praying, basically praying the same thing over and over and over and over. We're saying it different ways so we don't get bored. <laughs> and we're, you know... Sometimes we might add a little fact here, a fact there. You know, we're like, is this even mattering? <laughs> I'm telling you, there's much power generated. There's much power generated. They're, they're accomplishing much. We don't, we don't, we're not going to know until the final thing. So let's not right now, there's a time to process Okay, there is a time for everything. There's a time for, to process. There's a time to say, okay, what about the, what about the prophecies? Were our prayers effective? Were our prayers on target? Whatever. Now's not the time to process, okay? 
Now is not the time to process. Now is the time for battle. Now is the time for spiritual war. Now is the time to pray and fight. Processing is important afterwards. We will do that. We will do that. But now is not that time to do that. The prayer of a righteous man, of a righteous person, has great power as it is working. That's the English Standard Version. And the Young's Literal Translation says, very strong is a working supplication of a righteous man. I mean, just think about this. Prayer avails much, can accomplish much. It has great power in its working, and it's very strong. That, now, he was just, now listen, James was just talking about one, one person. He was just talking about Elijah. What happens when a company of intercessors like Elijah will come together in unity and pray? It goes way beyond what Elijah experienced. I'm talking about here locally, but then you add to that the multiplied effect of prayer in this nation and around the world. Listen, you know, God is going to get involved somehow. I, we don't know when, we don't know how. God is not just going to hear the cries of his people and be silent. I do not, I mean, I know the Lord in, in a measure. He's not just going to restrain himself. He is going to get involved at some point. Don't quit. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Intercede. Pray until the end. No matter what news you see, okay? This is a, such a time where we need to be like Caleb and we need to say, we're not going to believe the report that these, ten, these giants in the land, these giants are bigger than the word of God. Listen, we need to be very careful what we listen to. We need to be very careful what we read. We need to be very careful right now what we're taking in because there's a lot of doubt, a lot of discouragement. Again, I'm not trying to say don't look at the facts or deny reality or any of that. What I'm saying right now is don't allow the seeds of discouragement and doubt to sway you from prayer. That's what I'm saying. I think we've come. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I think we've come. This is really the reason why I wanted to preach first and worship second is we've come to a place in our battle. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to read the... Uh, the 21st century version as it applies to America of this. Second Chronicles chapter 20. So, so just grant to me that I'm going to use a little license here in, apl in applying it and reading it for our current situation. Now it came about after this that the Marxist and the globalist and the Democrats together with the elitists in the New World Order and those who want global government came together to make war against America and the Constitutional Republic. And they came and reported it to the, to the leaders, saying there's a great multitude that's come against you. They've come from all over. They have invaded this nation. And there's fear that came on the leaders. Verse 3. They turned their attention to seek God, to proclaim a fast throughout America. And America gathered together, the church in America gathered together to seek help from the Lord. Has that not been happening right now around this nation? And they came from all over the states and all over the places in America to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat, then the leadership stood up and they prayed to God, O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the nations and the kingdoms? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not drive out our enemies in the Revolutionary War? Did you not drive out our enemies in the Civil War? Did you not give this land to to your people who founded this on your principles and established our government based on your word. We have lived here. We have, you know, again, America needs to repent. I'm not saying we don't, but we, we, have, we have come to this place. Verse 8, where we can stand before you and we can cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and deliver us. 
We just say in this prayer, now behold, enemies from around the world and within America. They have now come and see, verse 11, see now how they are rewarding us. They're coming to drive out the, the founding principles of this nation, our constitutional republic. They're coming to drive it out and they're coming to take away the possession you have given to us. God, will you not judge them? Here's where we, we all feel right now. We are powerless. I mean, how many feel powerful right now? I mean, you're looking at all this taking place and like, what can we do? That's where we are. That's where the church is. We're seeing even this vote, go, this recount go on in Georgia, and it's not at all an audit. It's basically recounting what potentially, potentially is illegal votes and we're like, what can we do? Well, we've called, some have called different governmental offices and stuff like that saying, hey, we protest this, but at the end of the day, what can we do? We feel powerless, Lord. We feel powerless, Lord, before this great multitude who's coming against this nation. We don't know what to do. I mean, how many feel like they know what to do? No one hardly knows what to do. What? I mean, even those that are you know, higher up in governmental places, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Amen. Something shifted in our prayer on Thursday where the Lord came in and his holiness came in and he's rising up as a mighty warrior on behalf of this nation. I do not know what that's going to look like. I do not know when it's going to be manifested. I do not know any of that. But I believe the Lord is, a, is going forth as the commander of heaven's armies, and he's saying, I'm not on the right and I'm not on the left. I'm on heaven's side. Would you ride with me? Would you go with me? He who is not with me in this battle is against me. Think about that. I believe that's the word of the Lord. That came to us from our friends in Australia. Without going into a lot of detail, just to summarize real quick, there was a dream given in 2007 that, that the Lord Jesus himself is rising up as a mighty warrior against the Democratic Party in this nation. He's going to battle, and there's many Christians who are in alignment with that spirit on that party. And the Lord was not deterred in any way from his resolute focus to wage war against the evil that's come into the Democratic Party. And the Lord in that, in that encounter said, he who is not with me is against me. If we're not with the Lord in this battle, this is not right or left. This is what he is on the move to do uh, in this nation. We are against him. I believe now we've reached a line of demarcation in, this, in the battle for this nation where the Lord himself is rising up as a mighty warrior against his enemies and he's uttering a shout, he's raising a war cry and he is going to prevail against his enemies. And it's going to be the praying church who partners with him in this battle. See, we're, we're powerless. We don't know what to do. We're, our eyes are on you. And so, anyway, the prophetic word of the Lord comes in verse 14, in verse 15. Listen, America. Listen, American Christians. Listen to the praying church around the world. Do not fear, this is the word of the Lord, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. The nations have come against this nation. The battle is not yours but God's. This has now changed. The battle is not yours but God's. I think dad hit it on the, the hit, nailed it on Thursday. He said, we have spent six day, six nights or more praying our burdens. And that doesn't mean we, we stopped doing that. We still do that. But we have now cried out and said, here's our burdens. And that I believe now God is about to get into the fight. And he wants us to now carry his burden.
Do not fear. I just want to say, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. I'm preaching to the choir right now. I feel like I've been depressed all last week. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you have been discouraged. <laughs> if you love our country, you, you, know, you, you probably have been fighting discouragement. You know, it's okay. Just, I believe the word of the Lord to us. Just listen, to build confidence is do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Do not give in to discouragement. The Lord has heard the burdens and the cries of his people in this nation. The battle is not yours, it's now God's. Now again, that does not mean passivity. It does not mean prayerlessness. It does not mean we just sit back and wait for God to act. That is not what that means. It means now internally we can enter into God's rest. Internally, we can enter into God's peace. Internally, we can say, we can just rest assured we have done our part and we're going to continue to do our part, but now the battle belongs to the Lord. Now we've reached a line of demarcation where God himself is going to get involved in the fight. We believe, we believe. Again, it's up to the Lord. We're, we, we're not saying this 100% certainty. We believe God is going to get involved in the fight. Tomorrow, go down against them. Verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, America. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for God is with you. And so the leaders in America, they bowed their faces to the ground and all the people bowed down with them and they worshiped God. Now, verse 20, they rose up and they said, they said, here's what we need to do. Listen, verse uh, 20, think about this. This is 2 Chronicles 20, 20. We're in the year 2020. Maybe this is a word of the Lord to, the, to where we're facing right now. Oh, America, and inhabitants of America, put your trust in the Lord and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. What if God really spoke what he did through his prophets? Let's, we'll assess it later, but let's, let's put some trust in that just for a minute and wage war by the prophecies spoken that it is God's will, perhaps, for Donald Trump to win a second term. Put your trust in the prophets and you will succeed. Verse 21, when he had consulted with the people... He appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. And they went out before the army and they said, Give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the enemies. How we need that right now. They turned against themselves and they fought within themselves. God sent confusion into the camp of the enemy when the, when the pray, when the, when the well, I'm just going to apply it to us, when the church began to praise, when the church began to worship, when the church began to say, hallelujah, Lord, you reign over your enemies. When we began to praise, God began to fight. When we began to ascend in worship, we then began to descend in war. When we began to rise up our praise, God then goes forth like a mighty warrior. And he set ambushes against the enemies, in this case of Israel, but perhaps he might do it against the enemies in America. Let's, let's look at one more scripture, or maybe two more scriptures. Isaiah 42. Verse 10. Listen to what happens when the people of God praise, when the people of God worship. When the people of God ascend in worship, 
Notice what happens, what, what action God takes. When our eyes are on him and not the battle, when our focus is on him and not the warfare surrounding us, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. Uh, just keep going down, uh, just for time's sake. Let them, verse 12, let them glory to the Lord. Declare his praise in the coastlands. Praise goes up. Worship goes up. Notice in verse 13, the Lord goes forth like a warrior. As we began to take our place in praise, as we began to take our place in worship, and we began to realize the battle for the heart and the soul of America does not belong to us, it belongs to God. And the church in Jesus, of Jesus Christ begins to praise, and the church in Jesus Christ begins to worship. And I would even go so far to say intercessory worship. What I mean by that is this is we're not just worshiping, and we're going to do it in a minute. We're not just worshiping. We're not just praising. The, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of times we're praising and we're worshiping just for our relationship with the Lord. And there's a lot of times that we're praising and worshiping just, you know, for what God wants to do in the service. But what would happen if we took the place of intercession for our state and for our nation and, and we stood in the gap and we praise and we worship God on behalf of the state, on behalf of this nation, and we stood in the gap and we praised and worshiped him on an intercessory type place. Perhaps then God is going to go forth like a warrior. He's going to arouse his zeal like a man of war. He's going to utter a shout, raise a war cry, prevail against his enemies. I've kept silent for a long time. How many realize we don't think God has gotten involved yet. Now, maybe to a degree, but not like we need him to. I've kept still and restrained myself. Like a woman in labor, I will groan, I will gasp, I will pant. Finally, God rises up as a warrior and he lays waste the mountains and the hills and withers all their vegetation. He makes the rivers into a coastland and drives up the ponds. Our role right now, again, this does not mean we don't intercede and pray. We, we are doing that. But today, the strategy today in our prayer and intercession is the battle belongs to the Lord. Is we're going to take a place of intercessory worship, intercessory praise. We're not just praising. We are praising God because we love him and he's worthy of glory. And all that is true. And we are doing it because we love drawing near but we're also in a doing it not for ourselves. We're coming to a place of intercession. This is not for us. This is for our nation. This is for our state. And we're going to raise up in a place of prayer and intercession for this nation, for this state, to declare the high praises of God. Let's look at one more scripture and we'll, we'll get ready to, to, to praise. Psalms 149 Verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth. That's what we need right now. We need the high praises of God in our mouth. And obviously we don't have a, a physical two-edged sword, but we have the sword of the Spirit in our mouth to declare, to make declarations to speak to mountains that they would be removed, to say grace, grace, grace to every mountain of opposition, to execute vengeance on the nations, punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. Obviously, you're reading it. But to execute on them the written judgment where is the church of Jesus Christ right now within, in relationship to this scripture? Maybe we have abandoned our governmental role as the ecclesia to stand in the gap and to be the government of God on the earth. Listen to what it says. This is an honor for all his godly ones. 
I want to encourage you. This is an honor. What an honor that you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. What a privilege you have right now, whether you're here in person in Kennesaw, Georgia, or listening online, wherever you are in the nations, we need you for battle and spiritual battle right now. It is an honor, an honor that God has chosen us at such a time as this to stand in the gap in a place of intercessory praise and worship, to let the high praises of God be in our mouth and the sword of the word of God in our lips to execute vengeance and to execute judgment to bring forth justice as the body of Christ intercedes. What an honor, what a privilege we have. Amen. Let's fulfill that role. Let's fulfill that role. It, it was amazing. I, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday is uh, Shelly shared a dream of, I won't go into all the details for certain obvious reasons. No, I'm kidding. Um, if you were there, you know what that means. But uh, long story short, she saw Dagon. And then Drew, our worship leader, also had a vision that same time that he saw Dagon falling. What do we know about Dagon? Is we know it was God's presence and God's presence alone that caused that idol to fall. The powers and principalities we are fighting in this nation are massive and strong. It's going to take the presence of God and the presence of God alone to come in to smash the strongholds in this nation. But I do believe God is fighting this battle and he's inviting us, will you ride with me? And as that song goes, we say, yes, Lord, we will ride with you. Amen.